Hey everybody. I thought I would return to a sort of podcast style format and discuss a specific issue instead of the sort of weekly updates. Um, there's a sort of hot button issue. You might have already watched my No Mario Sky video. Uh, I hope you liked my rant in that because that's kind of our topic here today. Um, if you prefer to read instead of listen, I have two articles on my website that uh, are pretty much, you know, just going to repeat for those who don't really watch my website or would prefer to, you know, listen to a podcast instead. Um, the first article is Fan Protections. Bleh. Fan Projects Do Not Threaten Copyright Protections. Um, published that pretty much right when AM2R got taken down last month. Um, the second article I just published today about 10 minutes ago titled Fan Games Are No Less Protected Than Fan Art by IP Laws. Um, we'll be covering pretty much all of what's in both of those articles, and uh, this will be in a bit more conversational and ranty tone, though, you know, I do use the phrase fetid pustule referring to the uh, Our Games Art discussion, so uh, slightly ranty in those two articles, but uh, if you prefer to read, go ahead. Um, you won't be missing too much, I hope. But I might go off script. Yeah, that's right, Parker. Yeah. Sorry, my assistant is talking to me. Um, so... Where to start? So Nintendo has been taking down fan projects, uh, but they're only fan games. Um, oh, Parker, please. So there's a number of arguments to address. The first one that I discussed is there's a repeating, there's a repeating argument that I hear way too often that oh, if Nintendo doesn't take these down, they'll lose their copyright. Uh, this is uh, vaguely based in law, but it's based on entirely the wrong kind of law. See, DMCA, uh, the C in DMCA is for copyright. Um, when Nintendo takes down fan games, they take down by copyright, because that's the easiest way to do so. Um, copyright laws, if you're not familiar, look up the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, a.k.a. Sonny Bono Act, a.k.a. I forget the original name, but um, it's this really evil piece of legislation that Disney shoved down people's throats for uh, the purposes of explicitly protecting Mickey Mouse's copyright. Uh, that's not a joke, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Disney basically goes to Congress every time that Mickey Mouse's copyright is about to go up, and they push for an extended term. Um, this is basically, it's kind of like how DOMA is explicitly designed, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act, was explicitly designed to get around constitutional protections, which should be a pretty big warning sign, but, you know, uh... Congress is full of crooks, so you can't be too surprised. But basically, Disney goes to Congress every time that uh, Mickey Mouse's copyright is about to expire. They whine and moan, they give a lot of money, and they decide, okay, we don't want Disney, we don't want Mickey Mouse to be out of copyright, so we're going to quietly extend all copyrights after this date that suspiciously happens to include Mickey Mouse, and we're going to push it to about 20, 30 years in the future so we don't have to do this every time. Um, I believe the current act, um, I'm not sure if Mickey Mouse is included in the very earliest ending of the term, but I believe this discussion will happen again in 2020, so not too far from now. Um, but basically copyright is eternal, which is, uh, unconstitutional, because, but it, you know, it's, it's that sort of unconstitutional, like, DOMA, where they, you know, word it very carefully to be like, no, no, no we have... An ex you know, we have an expiration for copyright. We're just never going to reach it. Uh, if you're not familiar, the United States Constitution does explicitly state that uh, copyright must have a limit. So somebody, I forget exactly who, somebody jokingly referred to, oh, we should make it forever minus a day because, you know, blatantly mocking the Constitution is just hilarious, uh, especially, you know, in a legal case. That's great. Anyway. So copyright is basically eternal as long as you are younger than Mickey Mouse. Um, this, you know, honestly, patents and copyright terms should be shorter in the internet age because the way these things propagate is way different and we need major overhauls of basically all IP law. Um, but uh, that's a bit of a bigger discussion than I care to get into here. Um, so... Basically, copyright lasts way too long. That's the point there. Um, so another thing about copyright, um, I got off my original point. So a, a, a discussion that I hear too often is that, oh, they need to protect their copyright instead of 
uh, you know, because they'll lose the copyright protections. Well, the thing is, you can't lose copyright protections. Um, if you were born today, you will basically, if Disney has their way, you will literally never lose your copyright protections um, unless you willingly, you know, release the work into public domain, which is, you know, a manual action. Um, which I personally do encourage you to do if, you know, if you abandon a project. Um, a lot of artists will release their work into public domain after, you know, X amount of years. Um, a developer, Ein Chan, or um, she's the lead developer of Midboss Games, says that after five to ten years, she tends to release her projects into public domain, which, that's cool. Um, but yeah, there's no automatic process for that. You know, well, the automatic process has basically been short-stopped by... Uh, Disney and, you know, never happens. But you don't lose copyright. That's that's the point. Um, trademark is an area of law where, say, another game series decided to be called Metroid and Nintendo didn't, pro you know, say, hey, no, we're using Metroid. The law would eventually assume that, no, that's not a protected trademark and you're going to lose it. I believe that originally happened to, rate, happened to the name Refrigerator. Um... Refrigerator was a brand name, but it became commonly used to refer to any kind of, you know, refrigerator. So, um, basically, they, they lost that. And so, trademarks, you do have to be a bit more vicious, and I don't really, I don't like how that particular area of law works. But, the fact of the matter is, trademark law and copyright law are totally separate. They're both intellectual property law, but they're totally separate. So, that stipulation on trademark law does not apply at all to copyright in any way, shape, or form. Uh, AM2R doesn't really use Nintendo's trademark. Uh, Samus and her design are not trademarked. Just the name Metroid and Metroid Prime are, and their respective logos. Uh, that's why um, I think Dr. M64 is what his name was. Uh, the developer, the lead developer, they went and didn't put Metroid in the title. Um, you know, but the thing is, this whole copyright or this whole trademark discussion. They sent a DMCA notice, which is about copyright, which they can't lose. So, and even Nintendo is pushing this, you know, misinformation because their claim was that, oh, hey, they need to protect the, or their copyright or they'll lose it, which is false. So Nintendo is basically lying or at the very least misleading people and promoting this misinformation that if you don't viciously attack anything using your copyright, you're going to lose it. Which is false. Uh, this is not, you know, controversial legal information. This is a basic core concept of IP law in the United States that, honestly, everybody dealing with intellectual property on the internet should already know. I, if, I feel ridiculous that I, I feel like I'm, you know, this educated person telling these uneducated people things. It's like, I, I'm not a lawyer. I just have this basic competency that really most people should have about this kind of stuff. Um... You know, look this stuff up on Wikipedia, you know, read some, you know, basic law websites. It's really not hard to learn this information. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really not. Um, but anyway, the fact of the matter is, Nintendo does not need to aggressively take down these fan games. Uh, it's 100% at will. DMCA uh, is a thing that you can send 100% at will. It's been, there's been cases on this, and they've asked... And, you know, it's been asked in court if, you know, why did you, you know, delay requesting, you know, a copyright attack? Uh, the only the only case I'm familiar with where copyright, where a court said, oh, no, you, you didn't exercise your right um, and you're going to lose it was in a particular case where they waited until the, cop the infringing work got money and then they decided to enforce it. Because they wanted money. They didn't want to shut it down. And so law is kind of like that where, you know, sometimes there's exceptions based on, hey, you're kind of being an asshole. And, you know, trying to, you know, manipulate a law for something that's not really for, which is something that Nintendo's doing, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so Nintendo doesn't need to do this. Nintendo wants to do this. It's 100% at will. It's something they've decided they're going to be really fierce about it. A lot of com other companies are not fierce about it. Um, a lot of people point up Sega because, you know, they hired, um, you know, Sonic Mania. They got basically a guy who did fan projects, and they hired him before for the fan remake, or not the fan remakes, the official remakes of Sonic 2, and was there a 3? 
But there was a couple of Sonic remakes they made for mobile that were really good, by the way. The Taxman ports, they're usually called. Um, they're really impressive work. But uh, Sega actually has only recently been good to their fans. Um, Sega has a really sordid history, and I, I, I like my Dreamcast, my Genesis, but uh, Sega has not been a very good company. Um, I, I would not recommend holding up Sega, as you know, a holy figure, uh, the kind of assholes. But generally speaking, most companies don't go to the lengths that Nintendo does. Nintendo is extremely litigious, and uh, that's why defending them is a little iffy, because, you know, you're basically encouraging other companies to do this. Um, so that's why Nintendo doesn't need to. And here's why, here's a couple other things. So my second article was fan games are no less protected by fan art by IP laws. And how can that be, right? I mean, fan art, that's, that's safe, right? It's not. Um, there's absolutely no protection in IP law that says, okay, this kind of derivative work is safe, and this kind isn't, and based entirely on what kind of media it's presented in. Uh, the only real protections on derivative work is fair use. Uh, fair use really has nothing to do with what kind of, like, what medium it is. Fair use is like, okay, if it's educational or critical, you know, that that's probably all right. If it's uh, a limited use of the work, if it doesn't, you know, supplant the original work, like, um, say I bought a book review that is just the entire text of the book and it has a couple notes scrawled in it that's not okay because it you know it supplants the original work um it also has to you know well, well it doesn't have to the thing about fair use none of these are essential qualities but it's sort of a set of guidelines fair use is a very squishy thing it's kind of unfortunate um and another thing is that you know if you prove it doesn't have commercial impact you know fan games tend to you know Fan game, like AM2R, let's go down AM2R. So it's not particularly critical or educational, but the fact of the matter is, Metroid 2 is extremely old. Is it 20? About 20 years old? Maybe a little older? I'm not sure, Parker. Um, the effect on Nintendo's bottom line is pretty much zero, and it does not really supplant Metroid 2. If you've played Metroid 2 and AM2R, you can tell they're based off of each other, but they're really not the same game. Um, there's a whole major amount of differences, and people tend to overestimate how much of AM2R's art is derivative. Like, people think that the art was taken from, like, other Metroid games. It it really wasn't. There's a lot of original art in that. You know, it's obviously based on stuff in the Metroid universe. You know, it's supposed to look kind of like Metroid 2, but um, it's... A lot of those sprites are completely original. A lot of those, like, the bosses, most of those bosses weren't in the original game at all. Um, a lot of those, uh, all those sprites have been, at the very least, touched up. I believe the Samus sprite is vaguely based off of the Zero Mission one, but uh, it's not, you know, you're not going to find any identical sprites to anything in a Nintendo thing, you know. It's not like a ROM hack where they just, you know, copy and pasted Metroid 1 Samus and put her into Metroid 2 and there you go. You know, there's a significant amount of original work going in there. And that's another factor for fair use. Um, but a thing about fair use... Um, so, everyone says that Nintendo has a right to do this. The thing about fair use is that pretty much any of these cases that Nintendo has sent, they could be challenged on fair use. And I do think a few of them would probably win. But the problem is, fair use and IP law in general is extremely biased against the little guy. You have to take it to court to make a fair use argument. Um, obviously, fan game you know, developers aren't going to do that. Um, so even though it's entirely possible that legally, in court, you know, the fair use argument would be held up, uh, they don't just don't do it because you know it's so cost prohibitive because our law tends to protect corporations over the small people that's not a good thing for you to be defending by the way um so when you say nintendo is in the right you're kind of saying hey they're a big corporation so fuck you you little piece of shit um that's kind of well evil <laughs> so i kind of don't recommend taking that particular course of argument um so if, um, well, back to the main core of that article. So I said that fan games are no less protected by, than fan art. So what's the difference between fan art and fan games? Uh, legally speaking, nothing. Nothing. 
Fair use does not account for what medium it is. Copyright does not account for what medium it is. Uh, trademark technically does include some things like um, the thing about trademark is like because you can trademark like the name Air. Say I made a game called Air, and there is you know a company that wants to make dryers called Air. I, I unless my game makes promotional dryers, I can't go sue those people. That's pretty much the only case in IP law where medium kind of matters. And it's more like, you know, it's a commercial medium, not artistic medium. Uh, derivative works is always, you know, th the term in fair use is derivative works, or the term in copyright law. Um, co companies, or, you know, not companies, but too often companies. But um, the original IP owner technically has control over derivative works, that don't account for fair use, which is, you know, like I said, the squishy thing that, um, you know, it's hard to account for fair use. And I wish fair use was stronger. I wish, um, I wish we had better protections, but we do have some protections and I'll get to that. Um, so basically IP law doesn't care what a fan game is. It doesn't care what a remix is. Remixes are not legally protected. Um, technically you can't, um, well, I want to word by words carefully here, but you'll find a lot of articles saying that fan works are technically illegal. Fan work, fan art is technically illegal. That's not quite how illegal is tend to be used. Like <clears throat> when we say illegal, we usually mean it's a criminal act. Um, IP law is not a uh, criminal. You know, it's not a criminal part of law. You know, it's civil law. But uh, <clears throat> technically speaking, if you make a derivative work, and that's any kind of art. You're technically supposed to have explicit permission from the uh, copyright holder. That includes fan art. That includes remixes. That includes fan games. So why are only fan games what we get? Well, it seems to mostly stem from an argument I am so goddamn tired of having. The thing is, we don't consider games art, at least not on the same level as the other things. So when we see fan art, we say, oh, it's a, it's a picture. You know, that's not hurting anybody. That's safe. You know, it's, it's artistic. It's so, it's so pretty. We hear music. It's like, oh, it's not the original work. It's, you know, it just sounds like it's so nice. And then we see a game. We're like, oh, what the fuck? You made a, a Nintendo fan game. Oh, you motherfucker. You dirty piece of shit. How dare you? How dare you do this? And, you know, fan games, they do tend to use a lot of work directly, which that's less okay. But uh, in the music world, sampling has stood up. And sampling in music is the sort of thing that, you know, you could take it to court. To court but generally speaking, it's been just all right enough that people don't tend to bother. You know, if you sample a clip from another song, and, you know, you're kind of okay with that artist. They don't really want to screw with you. They're, you're probably all right. Um, as long as you don't like sample the entire song or something, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's similar to fair use. Well, basically, you know, it, it's a fair use that doesn't end up going to court because, you know, most fair use stuff doesn't. Um, the thing about fan art and stuff, uh, it's kind of protected by fair use, but like I said, you technically have to take it to court to actually make your fair use defense. The thing is, companies just don't consider it worth it. Our best defense against companies, you know, uh, over-eagerly uh, defending copyright and destroying fan works is that f everybody knows fan art doesn't really hurt a company. If anything, it helps. Everybody doesn't like when a company takes down fan art. So the thing is, the companies know, if I take down fan art, I'm getting almost no benefits, and I'm getting a lot of negatives. But the thing is, when fan games get taken down, People just shrug. They say, yeah, Nintendo, that was, that was good of you, Nintendo. You, you, you protect that IP that you don't actually legally have any obligation to protect. Um, people just shrug their shoulders, maybe even pat Nintendo on the back, say, it was your right. Um, but the thing is, Nintendo would totally be in their right to say, hey, DeviantArt, take down every picture of Mario. You have, you know, you send whatever the terms of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act are. You have this many days to comply. Uh, otherwise, we'll take you to court. They could totally, 100% do this. They could go to any website that hosts fan art, say, take down every single piece of Nintendo fan art, because, you know, we own these copyrights, and these infringe them because they're derivative works, and they'd have to take them down. 
there's no protection from that. If Nintendo wanted to DMCA all Nintendo fan art on DeviantArt, on Tumblr, on Pixiv, on Twitter, on anything, they could do that. But there would be a big fan art. Uh, there would be a big fan outcry. And nobody is really stupid enough, like they're stupid enough with games, to say, oh, you know, Nintendo is harmed by that work. Uh-huh. Because, you know, that's stupid. But the thing is, fan games, Nintendo also really isn't harmed by, you know, 99% of fan games either. Um, so the thing is, we don't really, we don't respect fan games. We don't respect games in general. You know, we see them as this commercial only thing. And like somebody just on Twitter today, uh, sorry if you're watching this, but I have to crucify you. Um, somebody said, oh, um, no Mario Sky was a product. A product. You evil fucker. You made a product. But here's the thing. No Mario Sky was free. It was a silly little game that does not supplant Mario Bros. 1. It has level 1-1 for Mario, uh, which, you know, (laughs) dozens of other games include at this point. Um, But, you know, it was just a bunch of procedural crap with a bunch of things that look vaguely like Mario elements, which a bunch of things that look vaguely like Goombas. Um, But it's a product because it's, it's a game, and we consider games products, inherently less artful than you know, art or music. But if you pay even the slightest bit of attention, you'll notice that art and music are extremely huge, like billion dollar industries that are extremely commercial. Um, In fact, a great deal of fine art that is hanging, and even modern art and stuff that's hanging in museums and stuff, was commissioned by extremely rich motherfuckers, um, or at the very least performed for, uh, for money. Um, the thing is, artists, they're actually human beings. This may surprise you. Um, they need to eat food. Sometimes they need money to eat food. Sometimes artists even use their skills as an artist to get money to eat food. Um, that is the core of a commercial you know, enterprise. You use your skills because somebody will give you money, and you need money to do other things. Um, so that's why art is commercial. That's why music's commercial. That's why games are commercial. Um... Games are no less an art form, and they are no less commercial than art, than music. But they're also no more commercial. Because, you know, you sell a thing for money, that's commercial. That's really, that's the only meter stick, you know. We tend to have this thing where, you know, we assume games are, you know, these big AAA productions and stuff. But that's increasingly false, you know. It's been inaccurate for a long time. You know, there's been garage developers since, since the Atari days. But, um... We still have a lot of baggage with how we consider games, and that feeds into this IP discussion where we think, nah, games, fan games, that's different. That's different. It's not art, you know. You know, maybe even maybe you even think that games are art, but when it comes to fan games, your opinion is a little different because you think for some reason they're different, and that's really it's just because you've been conditioned your whole life to think games are this different, weird thing. You know, it's 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 like a toy. It's different it's commercial it's strange it's not art you know even if you don't consciously think that when you think fan games and fan art are inherently different you're really the only way you can be thinking that is if you're thinking oh hey fan games aren't fan art because they're not art you know but that's not relevant the law doesn't give a shit what your opinion about whether games are art games Art, music, it's all the same shit to copyright laws. Um, There's no inherent protection or lack of protection afforded to either fan art or fan games. So, basically, if you say that it's totally okay for Nintendo to take down the 500 fan games they took down from Game Jolt, uh, that's something that's real that just happened a few days ago. AM2R is not an isolated case. Um, They took down about 500 games. And there wasn't really too much of a fuss. There was just some, some articles that said, oh, whatever. They're just fan games. It's not a big deal. Just fan games. And um, not too much was said of it. But if Nintendo did that with DeviantArt, there would be a huge outcry. The thing is, our only protection for stuff like fan games is to get mad. To say, hey, Nintendo, what the fuck, bro? To go on Twitter, say, hey, you shouldn't do that. Um... To maybe, you know, not buy some of their products. To at least voice your concerns. 
Uh, a lot of, you know, the, the sheer act of voicing your concerns gets a lot of shit, but look at the past few years of gaming. The original Xbox One, all of the DRM stuff, um, you know, the discs aren't real, gone. Connect, gone. Um, Nintendo sort of got an account system. PlayStation 4 is getting folders. EA has changed quite a lot. EA and Ubisoft kind of switched positions, actually. But even Ubisoft, um, look at what they did with Assassin's Creed. Could you even imagine in 2011 or so, 2012, that Assassin's Creed was going to be no longer an annual franchise? That happened because of fan outcry of, um, of Unity. And Assassin's Creed Syndicate sales even took a dive. Because the thing with games, you know, because of pre-orders and stuff, a bad game doesn't tend to affect its own sales. It tends to affect the next game's sales. So I've heard people say that Syndicate is a good game. I haven't played it, so I don't have an opinion there. But Syndicate took the hit for Unity, basically. Because people were pissed, and they had a reason to be pissed. So Ubisoft changed. And, you know, there's tons of smaller examples but basically, gaming has changed a lot because of, you know, fan outcry. The one company that doesn't really do anything is Nintendo. And I'm pretty sure a big part of that is because a lot of Nintendo fans falsely believe that if they keep defending Nintendo, Nintendo's gonna, you know, it's gonna be, you know, Nintendo's different. They're, they're nice, you know, they're like Apple. Except Apple's extremely evil lately. You know, they want to kill the headphone jack. They want to kill everything. Um... You know, people draw when people draw lines between Nintendo and Apple. It's a lot less flattering than I think they intended to be. Uh, Nintendo or Apple, well, both of them. It's a very litigious, nasty ass company. Uh, I like some of their design sensibilities. As a corporation, I hate them. It's a lot like me and Disney. Um, they make cool movies. They have great animators. Uh, a lot of cool people work for Disney. As a company. I despise that company. Um, freedom of expression and particularly copyright stuff, that's a big hot button issue for me. Uh, Disney Disney is straight up the antichrist for uh, freedom of expression and, uh, and copyright laws. Because like I said earlier, they're the reason copyright is eternal. Um, I, I really can't forgive that. And at this point in time, Nintendo is basically why, and, and their fans, are basically why fan games are not respected. And... Uh, a lot of really cool people started out making fan games. Um, Matt Rosak, who makes the Epic Battle Fantasy series, um, the first Epic Battle Fantasy, it's, uh, well, it had started out as a bunch of Flash cartoons that are basically Final Fantasy parodies. And parody is extremely well protected in terms of like fair use and stuff, by the way. Um, the problem, the only thing with parody is you have to take it to court. And like I said, most people don't have the money to do that. So people don't respect parody, but parody is one of the clearest cases of, you know, this is okay. Like, I'm gonna get you, sucker. That movie has so many parodies of so many black exploitation movies. Nobody sued them. At least I hope they didn't. But you know, it's parody, and you know, as long as you don't supplant the original work and stuff, you tend to be all right. But like I said, that's that touchy fair use stuff that unfortunately you have to take to court. I really wish it weren't the case. But. uh Back on track, um, really, the main problem is that Nintendo fans are so accepting of this. Nintendo doesn't consider it an issue. Nintendo is extremely t litigious over fan games, and their fans pretty much say, yeah, whatever, okay. You know, fans just shrug, they say whatever. AM2R was a better Metroid game than we've gotten in many, many years, but you know what? It's fine, you know? We got Federation Force, which, you know, has the worst final boss in, like, history, um, but, but that's fine, because, you know, it's a real Nintendo product. And I also see this stupid opinion running around that, uh, and yeah, opinions can be stupid, um, that you have to buy a game and play it in order to judge it. And, you know, to an extent, like, you know, I wouldn't believe a review from somebody that didn't, you know, own the game. But with something like Metroid Prime Federation Force, you can get mad at that without buying that. You don't owe Nintendo $40 for every single new release. You can say, no, I don't want to buy that. That's fine. It's your money. What the hell? You you have a right to not buy things. Nobody's holding a gun to your head and saying you have to buy every Nintendo product before you say, I don't want to buy that. I mean, that's kind of... <laughs> Unless you buy literally every Nintendo product, and if you do, you probably have a problem. Um, it's very silly to believe people should buy a product they have specifically stated they don't want to buy in order to say, you know, 
Because, I mean, if you have to buy a thing in order to judge whether you don't want to buy it, then you have to buy everything. That's, that's a little silly, isn't it, don't you think? You know, most people don't have infinite money. I don't have infinite money. But uh, there's just this... Um, <laughs> I hate to use terms like this, but there really is an issue with the whole Nintendo Defense Force mentality that um, they do some evil corporate shit. And people talk about them like, you know, they're your next-door neighbor, Dan, who's never hurt anybody. Uh, Nintendo is, you know, crushing fan projects left and right, uh, harming freedom of expression, um, shutting down birthday parties. Well, that was that was the Pokemon company. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Nintendo shut down birthday parties, too. But uh, that's a real case, by the way. Uh, the Pokemon company shut down somebody's... They had Pokemon-themed birthday party, and they shut it down. Um, that's the sort of stuff where companies, legally, maybe they can. You know, Like I said, fair use makes it questionable. But even ignoring that argument, even if you legally can do a thing, that doesn't make it morally right. Um, you know, the, the, uh, there's this common fallacy that law and morality are, you know, intertwined or possibly even the same. It's really not the case. Uh, slavery was legal. Um, a lot of discrimination has been legal. Um, Defense of Marriage Act was considered legal until, you know... A lot of laws are moral until they're not. Uh, there's nothing inherently moral about a law. Generally speaking, yes, the point of laws is to try and enforce certain aspects of morality. Um, when you're dealing with corporate law, that's less so the case. It's more like... Who can convince politicians to do what they want the most? Like, Google Fiber, uh, the biggest impediment to Google Fiber is not, like, any sort of, you know, it seems to be regulation, you know, just, it's so hard to get, you know, legal rights to do stuff. And that's because we have these entrenched telecom corporations that have a vested interest in making sure they don't have competition. So... A lot of people consider laws as something that, like, puts a leash on corporations. Um, sometimes that's true. But way too often, you know, a lot of corporations have influence on com on law. So a lot of time... Sorry, I'm fidgeting here. A lot of time, corporations will put in laws that harm other corporations, usually smaller ones, that they don't want to compete with. And that's evil. So when you're defending Nintendo doing stuff that harms other people for no real benefit to themselves. Uh, you're defending them being basically evil. Um, evil's a hard thing to, de to define, but uh, I do believe a massive multi-billion dollar international corporation stepping on fan artists. And you know what? I'm just going to call fan game makers fan artists, because that's all they really are. You know, art isn't only, you know, Paintings, art is basically anything with any form of artistic intent, and sometimes it doesn't have artistic intent. Sometimes it just has commentary intent, like uh, Duchamp's Fountain. You know, it was more a matter of commentary. But uh, in terms of art circles, you're not going to find too many people that are going to argue that it wasn't art. It had a lot to say about art. It was, you know, not necessarily very positive of art, but. Um, you're not going to find too many people that are into fine, you know, contemporary art anyway, that uh, consider that even a point worth debating. So it's kind of funny to see the gaming world having this argument that the art world has already said, nah, everything's art, what the hell, bro? Um, not everything is good art, but it doesn't have to be good art to be art, you know? Art is not a descriptor of quality. Um, but anyway, that's pretty much what I wanted to go over this this went slightly longer than I figured it would. My voice is getting a little hoarse here. Um, might have been a little faster to just read those articles, but uh, if you wanted something a bit more in-depth, I guess you got it. Um, hope you enjoyed. I um, I think I'll do a podcast sort of like this whenever I uh, have a big button issue, or hot button issue, whatever the term is, to talk about. Um, and I'll probably throw some like channel information in there too, like... Uh, I'll go ahead and say that uh, recently I've been playing a lot of Bunny Must Die. Um, I got the Japanese Vita version, and I've I've started speedrunning it, and I've gotten pretty good. I'm not I haven't I've been sort of speedrunning on my own. I don't want to look too much at the the very best stuff yet. I just want to you know get my time down to what I think is a reasonable best time without you know 
tricks I don't know, and then, you know, learn from there. You know. Yes, Parker. Yes. Um, sorry, my cat demands attention. Um, I just wanted to sort of be my first sort of chill intro, like, experience in speedrunning, and I'm not sure I'm going to speedrun too much other games. I do kind of want to speedrun, um, Dark Witch 2, but I can't record it currently. Um... Yeah, Blame Must Die has taken over most of my week, and I'm pretty okay with that. Uh, I do need to get back on... I've got a bunch of games to review, slash Let's Play, or whatever you want to call it, um, on Steam and Itch.io, and there's some stuff that's been in my backlog for a while. So I do need to catch back up. I've been sort of behind in terms of stuff, and uh, I've been learning a lot about the whole streaming experience, and I... One sort of downside to the streaming, once I do a live stream, I don't really want to do any more recording for the rest of that day. So that's why I'm currently down to two live streams, like, scheduled. So Saturdays I'm going to do Kirby stuff, and on Sundays I'm going to do either co-op or, like, standard indie games, or... Long term, I kind of want to do something where, like, if I streamed every day of the week, or, like, maybe four or five days a week, I want to do maybe an anime or Daojin game on one day, you know, a more standard indie game or alt game on another day, um, maybe a retro game or a Kirby game, because, you know... I run Kirby Facts on Twitter, so I tend to get a lot of views on the Kirby stuff. So that's what I've currently been doing. But I might sort of replace that with, you know, just older games that have been very influential to me, like uh, Dark Cloud 2. That's extremely long. I'm not sure I'd want to commit to that. Uh, Yoshi's Island, obviously, I like that. Um, Mario 64, I don't know, you know. Um, maybe not Maybe not Mario 64, not like the super obvious stuff, but influential older games that um, really mattered a lot to me. Not necessarily just the big-time stuff. And, um, you know, just sort of a variety of different games. And, like, I would like to have a schedule for that, but currently the live streams don't really give, you know, get enough attention to really be worth that. I think if, um, like, if my patron grew, if uh, my viewer numbers grew and all of that stuff, I would start doing that more. But, uh... It's a factor of value over time, so I, I just want to... I'm going to keep it to the two streams a day for now. Yeah, hope you enjoyed. Um, I would advise against leaving a comment if you don't want discussion back at you. This is an issue, that the copyright stuff. That That is an issue I'm very passionate about. Um, I know several of my fans are, too. Uh, I would kind of advise against arguing too much in the comments. I I tend to get rather passionate about this. Um, but I do I do always welcome comments. Just don't be an idiot and expect... If you say something stupid about copyright, do expect me to call you out on that. I, I will not be kind to ignorance on this subject and a lot of other subjects. But... Uh, Generally speaking, it's very safe to leave a comment on my channel. Just don't be an idiot. That's my main rule. You know, people leave first comments, and I'll remove those. Um, if people criticize something I do in a video, as long as they're not being a complete asshole, like, hey, if you forgot, you forgot the thing over here. You know, you had to do jump over in the corner, and whatever. I'm fine with that. People are like, you moron, you stupid dumb moron. You didn't even get the invisible item. You had to press B seven times and go to the right. How did you not know this? Everyone. Everyone knows that you get the secret invisible item, and then you input the Konami code backwards, upside down, and to the left, into your controller, while screaming into the mic, and then you unlock super boss mode. Everyone knows this. You know, if you do that, you're gonna get blocked from the channel. But, you know, just be nice, you know? It's not hard to be nice. I'm nice sometimes, and if I can do it, so can you. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Or listening, in this case. But yeah.